This episode of Fireside Chat is brought to you by Robert Woodward, lawyer at Altador Law. He specializes in family law, wills, and estates for flame fans in Calgary and Southern Alberta. Call Robert at 403-771-2187 and mention Fireside Chat to get $100 off any legal service. Are you ready? See you, Brad. It's time for another Fireside Chat, the official podcast of Flames fans. It's go time. Ten games left in the NHL regular season, and the Calgary Flames have clinched a playoff spot. They're the second team this year to clinch right behind the Tampa Bay Lightning. And what a celebratory week. As always, I'm Dan alongside Matt. Matt, don't you love it when we clinch and we didn't even do anything? The slacker way of doing it. Let somebody else score in overtime so that way you get into the playoffs. That's, yeah, I mean, for those that don't know, it was pretty much the Flames weren't even playing that night, and just because of the way the stars aligned and the games aligned, the Flames are mathematically clinched, so... Um, Thank it, you, Brock Nelson. Yeah, no, it, it's a good feeling, and it's nice to know they're clinched. I mean, we don't have home ice advantage clinched yet, but uh, pretty soon. I think we, we're, what, five points out is the magic number? Yeah, and realistically, Vegas is ten points behind us with ten games to go, and... The, for us not to get home ice advantage, we'd pretty much have to lose out, and that's just not realistic, So, especially with who we're playing in the next couple weeks. Well, let's talk about the last week before we talk about the next couple weeks. Interesting week for the Calgary Flames. Um, as we remember, we were talking before this, Calgary had won a big game in Vegas, and or against Vegas in Calgary, and then in came the New Jersey Devils, a team that has half their AHL roster recalled. And by the first part of the second period, the Flames had themselves down 3-1 to one against New Jersey and ended up coming back to win this 9-4. to four. That's not a comeback like that that you see very often. No, and uh, one person joked on uh, Calgary Puck, I think it was, and saying that uh, the Flames were trailing 4-3 uh, to three to new jersey after two periods that they just wanted to wait for the sharks game to end so that way the sharks would be watching and then saw what we could do in the third period and you know six goals in the third and you know frankly like that score was more indicative of how the game went anyway it's just that for the first two uh periods mackenzie blackwood stood on his head and it seemed like every chance that New Jersey had went in the net. Yeah, I, I was talking to some guys in the press box, and the thought up there, instead of of San Jose watching, was uh, somebody walked in the dressing room, Jelena or Peters, and said, hey, guys, San Jose just won, and it's like, oh, crap, okay, we got to do this. Um, yeah. So, some notes. Well, yeah. <laughs> right? Like, oh, okay, it's time to finish this one off. Yeah, these guys really do suck, so let's just put the boots to them. And Okay, can do. Uh, the first goal of the game went to Johnny Goudreau, so a good way to get things going. The first New Jersey goal, that Blake Coleman goal, I thought was probably directly a result of TJ Brody, Brody giving up the puck in our, in our zone entry and letting the Devils walk right in because of it. So yeah. I think that one's all on Brody there. Yeah, I agree. Um, And in the first period, it looked to me, I don't know what you thought, but it looked like the first line was trying too hard. I think that we saw them coming off that, you know, that Vegas game where they didn't get as many goals as they wanted to. And I think in the first, they were holding their sticks a little too tight. They just looked like they were trying too hard. They came back later, but they, they just needed to loosen up a little bit. Yeah, and you could see that the timing was a little off with them, them all, and they did recover and that's the important thing and good draw with a six point night which was kind of ridiculous and also just an interesting note here the third uh goal from new jersey kenny agostino former flame who we got in the jerome again the trade it's always nice to see a guy like that get a, a job somewhere i know he was playing with montreal and st louis briefly so Good to see him getting a shot, especially with the depleted Devils team, and hopefully he can earn himself a spot for next season. If you remember in last week's episode, we talked about how Froelich got four points in one game, and Johnny Goudreau, I think, in this game, looked over at Froelich in the dressing room and said, four points? Hold my beer. Yeah, pretty much. And Johnny went out and got himself six points in this game, a career high, I think, you know. A career First high time in 
I think first time in seven years that any player uh, had a six point game. And I believe, unless I missed some, first time in twenty five years for this franchise. Yeah, Al McKenna's had fun that one night. Um, yeah, that first line, as much as we talked about them slumping, they combined for fourteen points on the night. Slackers. And we talk about the secondary scoring sometimes not coming through. Bennett and Ryan combined for five points on the night. Again, slackers. Somehow, and I was looking through the, the score sheet afterwards, Kachuk, Froelich, and Jankowski all end up minus one on the night. That's just awful. Like, you know, at some point you just got to put those guys out with Johnny just so he scores and gets them to, to zero. Yeah. It's like, you guys are really not pulling your weight tonight. You know, you got to get out there. Come on. And Hamannick is plus five <laughs> on the night. So quite, quite all a in good... All, it, yeah, all in all, it was a uh, lousy first 40 minutes because, like, why are you losing to New Jersey? And then a very fun third period. For Flames fans, that was a heck of a comeback. Like, you could even hear it in the dome. People were getting louder and louder as it went on, and... It was just it was fun as a flame, as a fan of this hockey team. It was just fun to watch that one. Mm-hmm. And it got to the point where it's like, okay, hey, how many are they gonna get? Like, you know, we had the Ryan goal where it's six four. I'm like, yeah, okay, that's probably about it. And then Goudreau and then Monahan and that Laska Chuck goal, it was like, wow. I know. It's like you wish that there was like another two or three minutes so that way they could have got ten. And I feel bad for uh, the New Jersey goalie Blackwood. They didn't pull him out. They left him. They left his story butt in the net for all nine goals. I know, and he's actually been doing really well for New Jersey. That, that was the reason why they traded Keith Kincaid at the deadline was how good of a goalie M- Mackenzie Blackwood's been. It's just that when you're playing at the time the best team in the West, and you know your team half of it's gone. It, you know, stuff like that happens. You know, it's not none of those goals were on the goalie. He actually played really well. It's just that you know you have the caliber team we have and the you know a farm team. I was just surprised the there's end. a team that's trying to nurture a young goalie that you'd leave him in for nine goals. Well, to be fair, two of them were really late, so you know. But like even then, seven min- goals. Yeah. Well. Yeah. Right? Like, usually you pull a guy after four or five. Yeah, well, it, at the time, they were, you know, close in the game. And even 7-4, you're like, eh, we're down three. Who cares? You know, like, not much you can do. But then the last two. Like, if there had been ten minutes left, I think after the eighth goal, they would have pulled them. But, you know, with a minute left, you're like, eh, who cares? Just take your lumps. And... Yeah, I don't know. Not much, just, not much I, I you could, can do. I could see it if Schneider was in that. I was just surprised with such a young goalie they didn't pull him out. In, interesting decision by the, the coach. The, well, the coach probably, like as soon as the game ended, probably said, okay, boys, you have to buy him dinner. <laughs> Could be. Um, should we move on to the next game? Yeah, another fun one. The New York Rangers came to town, and this was uh, another big story. Chucky's scoring. Revenge. That's a good name for it, yeah. Uh, Chucky's Revenge. Kachuk has five points, so he's looking at uh, Johnny and he's looking at Froelich and being like, hey guys, I want to get part of this. So didn't quite get as high as Goudreau, but uh, Kachuk got that second line going. It was in an interesting game because there were some lineup changes here. Um, we saw Monaghan didn't come out for the second period. He was apparently not feeling well, so he didn't return. And so we saw the lineup shuffled. And made for some interesting pairings. Um, I, I noticed here that Kachuk, Lindholm, and Monahan worked well as a line in the second period on the power play. That's uh, that's quite an interesting group there. Kachuk with Lindholm in the middle and Mangiapane on the other wing. Yeah, you said Monahan. So or sorry, Mangiapane. No, nope. yeah, my bad. Yeah, Kachuk, so. Kachuk Lindholm, and uh, eighty-eight. Yeah. And then yeah, Monahan didn't come out for the third, and we saw them rotate centers a lot. We saw the same line play uh, the next game, which we'll talk about later in Winnipeg. But we saw on that first line quite a few times: Goudreau, Mon- or sorry, Goudreau, um, Lindholm, and Ryan. What did you think of that grouping? Well, Ryan is a player that he does an adequate job, and he's not great or bad at any particular thing. He's just decent in every aspect. So. 
having him fill in like uh, of course it's not you're not replacing Monahan with Ryan but it's he did an all right job i i didn't really see anything too bad it's kind of tough when you're down two key top 9 forwards in the contest so the next game of the week uh we see another high score in Calgary Flame as Kachuk gets Five points in this game, getting a point on every goal of the game as the Flames down the New York Rangers 5-1. to one. And, Matt, some interesting stories here. I guess the big one, Monaghan goes out after the first, doesn't play the second and third periods. And we saw that first line shuffled up. I was kind of worried because we just saw this line getting going again in the New Jersey game. And then we, we see 23 go out. And Derek Ryan was put on that line for a good portion of the game. So we had Lindholm, uh, Goudreau, and Ryan down the middle. What did you think of that tandem? I thought it was all right. Uh, Ryan is the type of player where you can kind of slot him in everywhere in the lineup, and he'll be fine. He's not going to blow you away, but like if you need a guy for a game or two or a period or two, he's more than adequate at doing the job he's not gonna blow you away but he's just serviceable yeah he's just very defensive to be on that first line that was my thing i thought they would try like bennett there or you know somebody else even uh, we saw backland there late in the game i thought that looked good i was just odd that to me anyways uh ryan got moved so high up the lineup yeah well it's also to reward him for his two goal effort against the devils and then an interesting power play line we saw in this one was Kachuk, Lindholm, and Mangiapani working together on that power play. Um, I thought they had some really good chemistry there, and again, nice to see Mangiapani getting some some time with some pretty big names on this team. Well, that's the thing. With his good performance of late, you want to try and foster that so he can emerge maybe as a quality top six-ish forward moving forward. And if he can take those next steps then you've got a really dynamite player for somebody who wasn't really thought of as that when we first drafted him so you know that would be a a big thing if he can emerge as a top tier player and encouraging him by giving him those type of opportunities will either make it or break it for him like he if he can rise to the occasion then we've got a really good player out of the deal and we were talking about Kachuk earlier, who had a point on every uh, goal here, either scored it or assisted it. Uh, he now has, after this one, 10 points in three games, five in this one alone. So he saw Johnny get six the night before, and Froelich the night before that got four. And it's like, whoa, guys. He's like, the, the player of the week is mine. That's it's right. It's mine. <laughs> and he, did, he didn't quite get to the six. Yeah. Um, but, you know, he did assist the first goal of the game he assisted on. That was a really nice goal. He passed it to Johnny. Johnny went pretty much end-to-end, shedded the checker and put one in. Like, that's the kind of goal that we're going to see when TSN's trying to still show us hockey footage in the summer and the best goals of the year. That's going to be on that highlight reel. Yeah, well, when you airmail a puck from behind your net to the opposing blue line and it's right, like, perfect saucer pass from like 150 feet out you know like that's yeah that's definitely going on the highlight real list instead of air mailing it when they play in seattle do you think they'll call it amazon priming it you never know um and then after the game talking to the coach uh, the coach said monahan didn't feel well but he didn't want him to infect anyone so monahan wouldn't travel with the team to winnipeg as we know um some some interesting things here th- that I took away just sort of as a takeaway on the game is I thought that the Flames really preserved their energy. I guess that's a nice way to say this. They didn't go out and bust their butts. Um, they played, you know, the, the whole game. They put in energy where they needed to, but they put in just enough effort to beat the Rangers. Yeah, well, the Rangers are terrible, so it makes sense. And, like, especially, like, if you look forward in the schedule, like, six of the Flames' next nine games are against teams that are kind of in that same level of mediocrity. So, like, with the Flames already clinching a playoff spot, they can kind of conserve a bunch of energy over those games while still being able to just beat them just due to talent. And, you know, it'll be good to see them managing things in game so that way they're both fresh and ready to go for game one 
And let's go to, to the dressing room for this one. I actually have some dressing room audio uh, after this Rangers game. Number 67, Michael Froelich, was asked after the Rangers game if there's any competition right now between his line and the first line after they both had such a high-scoring game in the same week. I think so. I mean, uh, you know, it's it's nice to see, you know, if, uh, if one line you know, doesn't score, the other scorer, and, uh, and you know, tonight was our line, and they, they kind of didn't. But, uh, you know, at least one, one line scoring like that, we'll, we'll, be, we'll be happy with that. So I think uh, it's nice that we can, uh, you know, switch it like that, and, you know, every line, you know, have to chip in. And uh, if we, you know, our top two lines didn't score, you know, I think it's, it's important that, you know, the other two bottom lines can score too. So, yeah, just keep going, and, um, you know, Matthew Kachuk walked the media through that awesome Johnny Goudreau goal that opened the Flames scoring for this game. Yeah, just, I mean, I saw Johnny skating pretty fast, well, flying, and um, I, saw the, I saw the D kind of, uh, he wasn't looking at me, so if I threw it up in the air, it's not like he could turn around and catch it and come back, so I just thought it's better than that than to rip it hard and see, you know, if it goes by him, so it landed like so fortunate, like fortunate bounces, kind of just like landed, like stopped. So Johnny went and made a move. And head coach Bill Peters was asked about Matthew Kachuk getting ten points in the last three games and what's made him so efficient recently. Well, he's, they're hard on pucks. That line is real good here the last three games, and they're they're feeling it in the offensive zone. They're holding on to pucks. They're finding each other, and they're relentless. They're reloading and working harder when they don't have it in order to get it back. So I think they're playing the majority of their shift with the clock. Well, Matt, we were asking ourselves after this game, I know the people I was talking about is, you know what, the Flames look good against so-so teams, like you were saying earlier, but can it translate to good teams? And the next night in a back-to-back, the Calgary Flames took on the Winnipeg Jets, uh, probably the best uh, opponent of the week, and weren't able to translate it against the good team. Um Mark Shifley scored in the first and Perot on the power play to end the Flames win streak. Uh, Mark Jankowski, the only Flame with a goal in the second period with a 2-1 to one loss to Winnipeg. Overall thoughts on this one? This was the one where if the Flames had had better luck, they probably win that one. I thought they were better than Winnipeg throughout the contest. It's just that one really bad face-off execution – late in the first period let the first goal in and then you know you let a guy get like five or six shots at it you know it you're gonna allow a goal so like See, it was I thought just, the flames were looking tired for this game eh, yeah i can see that but the talent wise they were better than winnipeg and i thought that for a good portion of the game they were better and they did hit the post a few times, and like if they had gotten a little better luck, I think they come away with two points. It's just, you know, it is what it is. You're down to three of your top nine forwards, uh, with Neil being on the sidelines as well, and second night of a back to back, you're on the road. Like there are excuses for it, but for sure you know, they it, just to me, I saw them kind of standing around and not hustling as fast as they should have been. I guess I was expecting more, especially considering they didn't put in, let's say, 100% against the Rangers. I was expecting a little bit more in this one. Yeah, that's understandable, but I I still thought they were better than Winnipeg throughout the game. It's just they didn't get the bounces when they needed it. And sometimes games like that happen. I think that if that game had been replayed like six or seven times, I think the Flames win basically all of the other ones. It's just... You know, two bad defensive decisions allowed goals against, and for the rest of the game, they played fairly well. So I didn't really have that much to complain about with them in that game. And just a milestone note here, uh, Lindholm assists the Jankowski goal, and that's his 50th point on the year. Not too often that we have guys getting 50 points in a season. 50 points or 50 assists? Uh, is it? Oh, you're right. It's 50 assists. Wow, he's got 77 points on the year. Yeah, the 50 points sounded a little low. Yeah, I was thinking that too, but I was looking at NHL.com. It's like, okay, it is their 50 50th assist. So 77 points. Like, when was the last time we had a flame get even in the 70s? Much less a couple flames. Yeah. Well, like Gaudreau, of course, but like other than that, it's been slim pickings, and so to have two. 
well, you know, even if you include Monaghan in that, like, it's... The, the Flames have had a really good season, frankly, from the top five scorers on the team. We talked about needing a top-line right winger in the offseason. I think, Matt, we found one. He, he's okay. You know, you could always do better than Elias Lindholm. You know, there's one or two players in the NHL that might be better. So, you know, there's always room for improvement. <laughs> Okay, I'm I'm not gonna I'm not gonna argue you there, but <laughs> uh, after 72 games now, the Flames have 44 wins, 21 losses, and seven overtime losses, which gives them 95 points. They're back in number one in the Pacific by one point over San Jose, and uh, they've clinched the playoff spot. First Western team to do that. Yeah, thank you to the Florida Panthers and the Nashville Predators for beating San Jose this week, especially Florida. Their goaltender, uh, Samuel Montembeau, which is like, um, who? I've never <laughs> heard of that guy. He got his, uh, I think, first win of his career against San Jose, so good for him. Excellent first win time of his to career do that. against San Jose or just first win of his career? I think first win of his career. I think it was okay. only his second appearance in the NHL, so wow. good for him. <laughs> there you go. So taking a look at where the Pacific Division stands as we record this, uh, Calgary's number one with 95 points, San Jose's number four with 94 points, Vegas is number three with 85 points, that leaves the wild card spots, Dallas at 80, Arizona at 78, Minnesota's right there at 77, and some would argue uh, Colorado and Chicago are there at 74 and 73. Matt, now that we've clinched, I think we can start to have the discussion that a lot of Flames fans have been having. Who's Calgary going to face in round one? And I think there's some favorable matchups, some non-favorable matchups. So why don't we do this? Let's talk first about each of our favorable matchups. Who would you like to see the Flames play in the first round? I think the easiest opponents would be Minnesota and Arizona in that order, uh, just due to the fact that neither can score very much and uh, they don't have good goaltending. Like, they're okay, but, like, they're not... They don't have Ben Bishop... Or uh, the, the goalie for uh, Bennington for St. Louis. Or Marc-Andre Fleury. So, you know, like the other guys, they're okay, but they're not great. So the Flames would have an easier time with either Minnesota or Arizona. I'm going to rule out, uh, I'm going to assume we'll talk Minnesota up in the standings here. We'll rule out Colorado and Chicago. Does that make reasonable sense? Yeah. Like, unless they win, like, the next six or seven games in a row... Then that you know, because they have a lot to overcome, and like that, you know, they could, but odds are not really. So I, I'd kind of scrap everybody below Minnesota. I agree with you. I think Minnesota, Arizona, favorable matchups. Um, I would prefer Minnesota of the two. I think Arizona. We've seen some teams that shouldn't struggle against Arizona struggling this year. I think they've got a good young team and a fast team. And I think over seven games, um, they might surprise the Flames. I don't know if they I would. Think, I don't know if they'd win, but I think that there might be some surprising losses there. Uh, yeah, I, I wouldn't expect wins. Yeah, I, I would expect it to be a six-game series. I don't think it's a four-game. I don't think with any of them really, it's a four and out for the other team. Maybe Minnesota, but that even that would be doubtful. So, like, uh, each series is going to be tough. Like, there are no easy teams. Like, we're not playing the Oilers or the Canucks. Or... Well, I mean, to make it to the playoffs, you've got to be a half-decent team. Exactly. And, you know, like, each of the teams has their pl positives. And, you know, like, Arizona, they're a very tight-checking team. They've only allowed 204 goals, which Calgary has allowed 206. So it's not like, you know... It, they're basically as good as we are on that end. It's just that we've scored 60 more goals than they have. So, you know, it, it's one of those situations where, like, it would be tough to beat them, but we would beat them. From a storyline perspective, I like Arizona because you can have Mike Smith beat his old team. Yeah, and I still think Smith is game one starter. Um, but we'll see over the next couple of weeks, but I still think Smith gets the nod. Looking up the up the ranks then and matchups we probably don't like, I think the other two options are Vegas and Dallas. Um, 
St. Louis is a possibility too, but that that would be a, of a similar oddity as Colorado or Chicago. Because St. Louis would have to lose a bunch, and Arizona and Dallas would have to win a bunch. Well, let's focus on Vegas and Dallas then for the other two matchups. Yeah. Um, of those two, who do you like? Who do you li- like the least? I would prefer to probably go against Vegas in that case, uh, just because Sagan and Ben seem to have the Flames' number for some stupid reason, and Bishop's really good when he wants to be. And I think uh, Dallas has surrendered the fewest goals in the West. Yeah, they are. And uh, only Tampa has surrendered fewer overall. So, Or the Islanders, pardon me. So At the same you know, time, though, Dallas also has the least goals for of all Western playoff teams. True. Yeah, only Anaheim and L.A. have fewer. And there's only a couple. Oh, no, they're, they're the third fewest goals. So each game with them is kind of boring. Like third fewest goals, second fewest goals against. Not a lot of offense. Like the Flames sh- would likely win that series, but with Bishop, I view him as being a better playoff goalie than Flurry, so I'm less concerned with Vegas because of that. But like I would really not want to play Vegas in the first round. I think the Flames can can get through Dallas without a lot of problems. I think it'll be a six game series if they do. I'm worried about Vegas though. If we have to play Vegas, I mean, yeah, I agree with you. The Bishop is probably the better playoff goalie, but Vegas made it to the finals last year. Like they've only gone up on their roster from there. And I think you might see Mark Stone really kick it into gear in the playoffs. I, uh, I think if the flames play against Vegas in the first round, they could be in trouble. Yeah, I agree. And like, you see, like, this is why, like, basically all season I've been saying that it's imperative for the Flames to win the division, just because of the fact that it's a lot easier to beat one of the lesser teams in the first round and then let San Jose and Vegas kick the crap out of each other and then pick up whoever wins, then go against them. And, you know, like, instead if the Flames play Vegas in the first round, then they have to beat Vegas and San Jose. And if they manage to get through that, they're going to be beat up and tired and they'll likely lose to whoever wins the Central. So it's one of those situations where Calgary, if they can get through the, like, win the division, get through the easy team, then they can possibly go on a protracted run. It's just that it's going to be tough either way, of course, but it, it'd it be a lot easier if they win the division. Yeah, what do you... Well, let, let's finish on the playoffs first before I ask you this question. But um, So it sounds like we are all in agreement that Arizona-Minnesota, the better matchup. Uh, you like Dallas le- less than Vegas. I think Vegas is the worst matchup they could get. Um, but... Yeah, I don't know. Looking at this, I think, like you said, I think they can do Dallas, even though Dallas has the least goals against. They've also got the least goals for. And I'm pretty confident that our, uh, I don't know, I think our defensemen can probably neutralize those two threats in Dallas. But Vegas, of all these teams that we're talking about, I think Vegas could be the one that could end the Flames' postseason run early. Yeah. And, like, I'm more concerned about the connotation of facing Vegas in the first round because that means that we didn't win the division. In which case, if we do somehow beat Vegas, we're likely going to have to play the Sharks in the second round, and that's just not nice. Well, let's talk about that. So the Calgary Flames have 72 games left. They have 95 points right now. Uh, San Jose also 72 games left. They have 94 points right now. Looking at our schedule, looking at San Jose, looking at kind of the team streaks lately, um... What do you th- how do you think this one ends up in terms of the Pacific Division? Well, Calgary has a bit of luck. Of the 10 games remaining, they play LA and Anaheim twice each, which they're the sec- the worst and second worst team in the West. So, you know, that's four games that they should win. Then they also play Vancouver, who's the third worst team, and Edmonton, who's the fourth worst team. So, again, like, all six of those games, they should win. 
And then you have the Ottawa Senators, who are the worst team in the NHL. So seven games of the ten, they should win just because the other teams are terrible. So if they do that and just beat those teams, that that means that San Jose would have to win eight of their games, assuming that we lose the other three. And we play Columbus and Dallas, who are both wildcard teams right now. Uh, Columbus is in 8th um, with 84 points, and Dallas is 7th uh, with 80 points in each conference. And then we play the San Jose Sharks. So San Jose's schedule is similarly kind of on the light-ish side as well, but theirs is slightly more difficult than ours. And It's one of those things where if Calgary can beat the bad teams then they likely win the division, but if they start losing some of those ones, then it gets a little dicey. Looking at the the games for both teams, sort of before, I'm looking at the 31st of this month when Calgary faces off uh, against the Sharks as the game that's probably going to end up sealing the deal in the Pacific. I agree. If we look at the games before that, uh, Calgary has... No back-to-backs before that. Like you said, they play Columbus, Ottawa, Vancouver, L.A., Dallas, Anaheim. So they have six games. There's six games on both sides. Uh, Vegas, L.A., Anaheim, Detroit, Chicago, Vegas again uh, for San Jose. The benefit we're going to have going to that San Jose game is we are fresh. They've actually come off a back-to-back with Vegas, who I think is going to be really motivated to to win that one. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, I could see the backup goalie going in and against Calgary. Um, and then if you look in April, we have the rest of our California sweeps. So we've got uh, L.A., Anaheim, and then back home for Edmonton, where San Jose's got Vancouver, Edmonton, Colorado. So I think even if we can beat uh, San Jose in on the 31st, I think we probably will get more points in those last three games in April than them. Yeah. That's why I like it, especially with, it's imperative that Vegas wins both of their games against San Jose. Please do that, Vegas. We really want you to win. Go Vegas, go. Well, and interesting yes. they have two games so close together when this could be a playoff matchup. Like, you really get some good scouting in there. Oh, yeah, for sure. Go Knights, go. Go Knights, go. Um, <laughs> I, I really think right now, looking at these schedules, this is in this is Calgary's Pacific Divisional lose. If, yeah. you know, even if they go 500 the rest of the way, ha- win half their games, I think it's theirs. Um, if they go on a protracted losing skid like we've seen, you know, start losing two, three, even four games, I think they're out. So, you know, and, and I don't even think that they need to necessarily win them all, but you've got to be getting a point in at least 500. Just my rough math in my head. I think you got to get a point in half the game. So this is really Calgary's uh, lead to lose. Yeah, I'm I'm figuring like 107 to 109 points does it, like 12 to 14 for Calgary. It, it depends on how Vegas does against San Jose tonight. Like if Vegas can actually beat the Sharks and, you know, it deletes a game from San Jose, I think that gives us a little bit more breathing room. But the Flames, like what I'd like them to do is ideally beat Columbus tomorrow and beat Ottawa on the 21st. So that way, like it puts a lot of pressure on uh, the Sharks for the LA game and the Sa- the Anaheim game on Thursday and Friday. So, you know, like it, the more points that Calgary can get early, the more it makes the life for the Sharks difficult and the more difficult it is for San Jose the better. Calgary seems this year to be playing better when they have some motivation. I think maybe having the Sharks so close one point down might be the motivation these guys need to sort of, you know, keep their head above water, if you will and we don't need to be a lot of the Sharks, we just need one point over them to win it but I'm wondering if, you know, that motivation that we only have 10 games left might be what the Flames need to to keep this, uh, you know, this good play they've been having and these big these big wins alive. Yeah, well, they definitely need to win against Columbus tomorrow, and I think the fact that they have the day off today and San Jose plays, like if San Jose wins, I think that Calgary will be coming out gunning for the Blue Jackets tomorrow. Whereas if San Jose loses tonight i think calgary might be 
not as much pressure to go out and beat Columbus. Like, they'll want the points, but I don't think that, like, there's more room for error. Yeah, if I that can makes see sense. That. So, see that. we'll see. We'll see. And then while we're talking about playoffs, it was announced today on uh, Twitter by Ryan Popowicz, who's the director of marketing for the Flames, Hitmen, and Roughnecks, that uh, every home game during the playoffs, the Calgary Flames will be wearing their retro red jerseys, those 80s throwback jerseys that everybody likes. So interesting, kind of interesting that they're really retiring their home jersey for the playoffs. Um, But, hey, those, those uniforms worked well for them in 89. We might as well try it again, right? Well, considering they only went on one run since then, uh, and only one uh, one playoff round other than that year, uh, yeah, why not? Anything, you know, do something different. I wonder how much of this is a marketing angle and how much of this is hockey superstition. A little bit of A, a little bit of B. I think that you know they're. I think they're probably going to want to go to the retros anyway or a retro themed jersey whether they switch it up or not and you know what better way to parlay that sort of like what pittsburgh did a couple years ago and then uh, ryan popovich also hinted that while probably not next year we might see the retros come back in full force but he did uh he, he did post on there that we will likely see the retro whites back next year so we could see the full retro kit if this is soccer, the home and away. Um, Matt, I don't know about you. I'm thinking that if we're going to see retro whites next year, and I said this to you already when the game was announced, I think it's at the outdoor game, the Heritage Classic. Yeah, I think we're going to go with that, which is all right. I think between Calgary and Winnipeg, there's enough money to be sold from both teams selling retro jerseys. Like The whole reason you do it is to sell jerseys. If Calgary goes retro white, I bet they'll sell a ton. If Winnipeg goes their retro blues and goes back to the throwback Winnipeg logo, they'll sell a ton. So why create a new jersey? True. Just lame. I don't know. It's at a neutral site. I think it's kind of cool to go to the neutral site. And I mean, I could see if it was in Calgary or in Winnipeg. I don't know. Something about the neutral site makes feel like it's appropriate. It's like, well, we'll just, you know, go retro for this one. Yeah. Um, and, and there's been some really like, you know, my thoughts on the last Jersey here, but there's a lot of teams I think try too hard with their outdoor jerseys. And a lot of them I think look pretty stupid. So I'd rather go retro white than get some stupid Jersey just for the sake of making a new Jersey. I really like the heritage Jersey. I know you did, but I mean, look at some of the ones in the last couple of years too. Like, oh yeah, I know a lot of the newer ones. Yeah. Have, like I pretty much have to go back to that Detroit Toronto game, the Detroit Jersey in that one that was a really awesome jersey and i think that was the last one that so looking at the outdoor designs i'd rather go retro white than have those designers make us a new one yeah a lot of the outdoor jerseys are like especially the ones that go modern like they tend to really suck (laughs) well and knowing where the nhl is going we'll get some recyclable jersey like the uh the all-star ones this year that has you know a, a silver crest or something weird yeah, well, it, you know, it, or they could make it an Oilers jersey and you can recycle it by throwing it back on the ice. <laughs> there you go. Um, so I, I'm I'm not opposed to the retro red. I think it's kind of, I think if they go deep in the playoffs wearing the retro red and then you sort of go back to your regular jerseys next year, it's going to be weird. So I think they have to kind of be ready. Maybe not those retro reds, but I think if they're going to go deep wearing those, they sort of have to be ready for launching something new next year i agree and i think that's already in the cards to be honest like if they wouldn't have met, i don't think they would have announced that if they weren't already intending on going that route i don't necessarily want them to wear the retros for you know 41 home games but i'd like to see a new design with the retro styling does that make sense yeah i agree and like uh, we've even mentioned this in the past where like if, if they just went like the exact retro that it was in the 80s that that'd be kind of lame and you know unimaginative and like if they did something a little different that had like mostly retro themes but you know some differences to it then that'd be fine yeah like i think even if they sort of get rid of the black and yeah. Just go with a red and yellow and white color scheme. Put the red C back on white jerseys and the white C back on red jerseys. I think just 
those simple, you know, changes. Yeah, would, you could even you know, you could even throw the horse head jersey back or logo on the shoulders for something different or, you know, like there's plenty of different things that you could do to have it similar to the old ones but different at the same time. I I know it's weird to say but I kind of like them to get rid of the black helmets. Uh, actually, you know, honestly, I think that because of how bland the current kit is to use your term for the soccer jerseys uh i think that it, you know like ever since they went with the vertical stripes like it's the flames in my opinion have had one of the three or four worst jerseys in the nhl well the flames are the first team to do vertical stripes remember back in 98 with the uh with the pedestal jersey yeah and i think yeah, and I think that those, like when they changed it in 0607 to their current setup, like it, it's just not good, and it has never been good, and it's always been kind of a lousy jersey, and you know it's okay, but like it just wasn't executed properly. I like the I like the 030 to 06 ones. Yeah, same here. Like, uh, even the, if they had taken the, that, uh, Calgary script third jersey, rounded the shoulders, and, like, put, like, regular numbers and font on the back and a Black Flames logo on the front, that would have been an awesome Flames jersey. Even, I'm just looking here on NHLuniforms.com, the, uh, the 03 to 06 jerseys, those white ones, they had enough black that I think it helped the yellow stand out against the white, but it wasn't overpowering. And I, I would be okay if they go back to something like that, where there's just a little hint of black, but it's still red and yellow primarily. Yeah. I know. And black has always been a good accent color for a jersey. And teams tend to go a little overboard, like how the Flames did with the all-black blasty jersey. And, you know, like it... If you use it properly, it can look really good. It's just that the like flames... I've, I've always liked the modern C with the black outline on it better than the old C without the black outline. Yeah. And, like, it's just one of those things where, like, they either use too much or too little. And, you know, like, it's, you know, it's just not quite right. And, you know, they, they can do a lot better with it and... You know, hopefully the new design, if they do go away from the black, I'm assuming a third jersey will be done with some black in it, and hopefully that's more interesting. I think if they get rid of the black, you can't have a black third jersey then. Yeah, I don't see why not. Go yellow? Oh, God, no. No, I could see it, I could uh, see them keep the 80s retro red as their third jersey because everyone likes it, and then unveil some new similarly styled uh, jerseys. Yeah. Like, that would be horrible, you know, if they kidding. went with a yellow jersey. Like, you know, like, it's bad enough when we have to look at the Oilers in their bright neon orange pylon disgustingness, you know, like, and Nashville, frankly. <laughs> you know, like, we don't need yellow. Another annoyance of mine, and you know this for years, I've talked about on the show, the Forever Flame program. Uh, it seems like we have two tiers of important players here. Those that are retired and those that are in Ken King's Forever of Flame program. And Elliot Friedman mentioned recently on his 31 Thoughts podcast, he's hearing out of Calgary that they might be killing the Forever of Flame program. Um, I would imagine then they would just retire numbers 2 and 25. That was kind of weird because guys have worn them since. You'd almost have to retroactively go back and Photoshop out photos of Freddie Hamilton wearing 25. Um but I, I'm all for this. I think you don't do a ceremony. You just quietly change the, the banners in the rafter and burn any current jerseys with those numbers so they're retired. What yeah. do you think, Matt? Yeah, and that was always a dumb thing, frankly. Well, I mean, and you've heard me. You've heard me. You had your coach rant last year, and you've heard me rant on this before. I think it's a really stupid program. I agree. You're either um, good enough to be retired or you're not. Yeah, it's like, if you're wanting to honor somebody who, like, say, like, a guy like Regeer, you know, you put a display or something up in the concourse or something of, you know, like, this is 
you know, like our Hall of Heroes or something, that, you know, the guys that were really good for a long time, but not quite jersey number retirement material. Or the guys that are important to Calgary, but aren't yeah. retirement material. Like, you, I'd say you could put Connie in there. Um, yeah. You, know, you could put Tabarachi in there. Yeah, I guess. For his period. Uh, yeah. Or uh, Jelena. Yeah. Possibly. Like, you know, like there are certain, you know, like you could do something like that if you're going to honor people that aren't worthy of a jersey number, but, you know, you you want to honor them nonetheless. Like when a guy like Gary rafters, Roberts. It should be retired. Yeah, exactly. Because, like, it's kind of chintzy. Uh, you know, like, you're going to all that effort. You might as well do it all the way. You know, like, it, it just... It, I'm not a fan of ha half measures at any point. You know, like, if you're going to go all in, go all in. And, you know, you're bringing the guy in. You're making a banner. You know, do it right. <laughs> well, and and I could see if... um, I don't know. I could see maybe Forever Flame is the name if... Um, you know, the guy was had passed away or something, but you can't say you're forever aflame when Al McKinnis is the vice president of hockey operations for the St. Louis Blues. Like, obviously not forever aflame. He works for the Blues. And same thing with Neuendijk. Like, you know, he's been GM, AGM all over the place. So, wow, you're forever aflame. But most recently worked with Carolina. Like, I don't know. It just it doesn't feel right. Yeah, I know. It's just a silly idea. And, you know, like, it's one thing, like, if they're wanting to honor them on the concourse or something, then awesome. Do that. But, you know, like, I don't know. It, it just seems like a half measure. It's kind of lazy. And, you know, like, do it right. You know, it, that's one of the things that, like, the Flames have had a problem with, frankly, for a long time is that they do things, like, half of the way correct. And then they don't follow through. Uh, I hate to say like, it, that's kind of why I was surprised the Jerome ceremony was so good. Yeah, same here. And for that very reason. I was kind of sitting there watching it being like, okay, hey, what's going to screw up? What's going to screw up? There's a Calgary Flames event. Yeah. And, you know, it, and like we even mentioned that back when the Flames released that uh, script third jersey of how it looked like five different designs, like, mashed together into one. And the number five is an upside-down <coughs> two. Like, that's still my <coughs> least favorite part of that jersey. They just took the two and flipped it upside down and put it on Geo. Yeah. It's like, great. Awesome. Save on the fives. You know, like... <laughs> you know, like, we're, we're trying to... All right, we're able to re-sign Kachuk because we didn't buy as many numbers for the jerseys this year. Like. <laughs> you know, maybe we should go get Martin Furk off... Uh, I, what Detroit? You know, three letters on his name. How promote foo? Save on those letters. What's your name, <laughs> Devonte Smith Pelly? Now it's just Mo. Those are the letters yeah. we have left. Those are the ones left. We're in just gonna call you DSP. There you go. It, it's like yeah. playing Scrabble. Here's the letters the trainer has. Assemble them into a name you like. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Create your own name. <laughs> That's right. Um, but you know, like it's. I don't know. I think Forever Flame is kind of silly. Um, like you said, they've done Forever Hitman. I think now they're doing Forever Roughneck. Like, it's just, it's really silly. I don't think, though, you can do a ceremony for these guys. They've had their ceremony. I think if you try yeah. to do something different, oh, yeah. you admit defeat. I think at the end of the season, they just quietly change the banners, get yeah, rid of 2 that, and 25 in the rotation, it. and move on. Yeah, exactly. And if you're wanting to honor, like, guys like, say, Regeer, then or Roberts or, you know, guys like that who were here for a long time and did a lot for the team. Awesome. Create like a little pavilion in the, co in the concourse or something. And I can actually see that being a big feature of the new rink. Some sort yeah. of like hall of heroes as you walk in. Yeah. Like it, you might not necessarily want to retire Kipper's number, for example. I think they should mind you, but you know, you might not want to go to that extent. Well, that would be a perfect player for that. And, you know, like, stuff like that, and I don't know, like, to me, it, it makes more sense, like, for guys that not are not necessarily jersey retirement worthy, having, you know, because, like, you're going to have to put something out on the concourse, you might as well have, like, a section that's just, you know, dedicated to your team's history. See, I think it'd be cool to have in the new rank, 
I think it'd be cool to have um, like a display case or two of just team memorabilia, stuff that's important from the past, cool things from Flames past. And then I think even having sort of like your, let's call it the forever flame display, but it doesn't even have to be all the guys permanently. I could even see every game. If it's like a digital screen, one game features Kipper. The next is Regeer. The next one is Conroy. So there's always something different to see there. Yeah, that'd be an interesting, innovative thing. You know, so every game it's featuring a different flame and maybe they put out some of their stuff. Here's Conroy stick or puck or whatever. Yeah, something. Uh, that would actually be a really cool thing uh, as well. And, you know, it, yeah. And, and for guys like you or season ticket holders, it might even get you to get out of your seat a little bit and go to that concourse, look at the display, and while you're there, decide you want a pretzel or a beer or something like that. Well, that would mean that I'd have to actually get up. Like, come on. You know, it, it's hard enough getting walking all that way up those stairs, sitting down. You know, like, what, you want me to actually walk around some more? Like, hey, they've, they've skipped the dish to the cell dome now. You can get food delivered right to your seat. Awesome. <laughs> Um, but yeah, I think that if if I was in charge of things, that's the way I would go. Is I'd almost have it that every uh, game we featured a different player. Yeah, that'd be actually. I think that'd be a really awesome way of going about it. And you could even have it interactive as well in some aspect. Maybe you have like a puck with the guy's name on it, and it's here's the guys who will be featured over the season. And every game they just roll a different guy's tape, if you will. Yeah. And, like, have, like, a highlight reel of that guy. I think that'd be actually a really dynamite idea. Calgary Flames, if you're listening, you can have it. Yeah. You're welcome. It's my contribution. Um, so, I, I think it, overall, if this happens, it's going to happen quietly. I think if the Flames, especially if the Flames go deep and they have a banner to retire, whether Pacific Division champions or Western Conference champions or something else at the end of the year, I think we see those change just that it looks more uniform next year when they raise their new banner. Yeah. And, you know, if they did a section with that, just to go back to that, on Tony Amonte, then all you'd have to do is just have the sound of the ping off the post playing on repeat, and there you go. Well, <laughs> and it's cool, too, because you could do, you know, based on what's going on in town, or maybe there's a night where it's like, hey, this tonight we're going to honor goalies, and during, you know, the first period we'll play a Trevor Kidd montage, during the second a Mike Vernon like, you know, you could even change it up during the game if you wanted to. Yeah. I think that's actually a really dynamite idea. And, you know, if we're going to get a brand new rink, it's going to be equipped, I would uh, hope, with all the latest, greatest, you know, tech and audio video stuff. So why not utilize those things? Yeah, that'd be awesome, I think. I don't know you could do interactive, because I think you'd, you'd screw with the flow in the, true. In the true, true, true. atrium if you're trying to get people waiting in line to play with this thing. True. True. Um, unless it was like in the presence boxes or something like, you know, down in the fancy lounge there. But I think, think about now, if you were to have people stop in the middle and wait in line to play with something, no one's ever going to get to their seats. So the concourse is designed to move through, not yeah. to stop in. I've heard people yell that. Um, well, looking at the current team, let's, uh, let's come down from the rafters, look back on the ice at the Calgary Flames. They made another recall. Curtis Lazar is back. Again. Oh, no. Um, Not Lazar. He's ra he's racking up the frequent flyer miles. He's going from Calgary to Stockton to Calgary to Stockton. And right now the Flames actually have some injuries, so he might finally play. He's probably not going to get Watherspooned this year. Um, you never know, you know, because if either Bennett or Monaghan are healthy, then back down to Stockton he goes. At some point you just say, you know what, uh, I'm going to stay in Stockton, like, I don't know, call a foo or something, like I'm done. Yeah. Screw you guys, I'm going home. Um, but no, <laughs> I, I have a feeling that they will play Curtis Lazar tomorrow night against Columbus. Yeah, I I would assume so as well, and hopefully he plays well, because, you know, I'd like to see him be back next season in a more full-time role Mon with the team. Monaghan has looked off the last couple games, and I think this might be a good excuse to get him some rest whether yep. that's resting injury or whatever it might be. So I think we'll probably see Lazar on the fourth line tomorrow, um, jumbling up the other lines, moving some people around. Another option that they have is James Neal, and James Neal was back on the ice today at practice. 
uh, didn't skate with them or it wasn't on one of the main lines. But I'm thinking, you know what, if Bennett and uh, right now it's Bennett and Monaghan are listed day to day and may not play tomorrow. I mean, what a perfect time to put James Neal back in the lineup. He could probably be put on one of the top two lines and get some good quality minutes against a team that maybe even he might be able to score against. Yeah, like if you say like they're not available, Monaghan and Bennett aren't available on Thursday, then Neil could slot in on the first line with Lindholm and Gaudreau. Knowing the way things are going, Neil comes in and gets four points. Why not? No, he does uh, Sam Gagne where he gets like eight points. And, you know, it's like, uh, what? If he's going <laughs> to score, he might as well score against Ottawa, right? If he can't score against yeah. Ottawa, you probably shouldn't be in this league. Yeah. Exactly. Um, so I I think Neil will be back in either Columbus or Ottawa. I'd probably put him in the Columbus game if I was the coach. Um, and I think having Bennett, Bennett and Monahan both out right now, let them sit for a little bit. I mean, it's you know, let's see what other guys can do, and let's make sure these guys are ready for the playoffs, not rushing them back in now that we're clinched. Yeah, it depends on the Sharks game. Like if uh, the Flames, uh, they. Uh, if the Sharks lose to Vegas, which they're down 3-2 halfway through the first, which that's weird. Anyhow, um, if the Sharks go on to lose that game, then I think you don't need to necessarily rush Monaghan or Bennett. And, like, if the Flames drop the Columbus game, it's like, eh, okay. You know, but if San Jose wins tonight, I think that you might have to put those two guys in if they're close to being 100% and just hope that everything works out all right. If Monaghan is sick, like they didn't take him on the trip because he was like sick with, I uh, imagine, a flu or something, you don't want to put him in though because you'd rather keep him out than infect the rest of the team. So if he's contagious, you got to keep him out. Or we get him to go uh, breathe in the visitor's dressing room and then go home. Yeah. Do some, you know, uh, biological warfare. That's right. Go use the toilet in the visitor's dressing room and then go home. Just yep. le leave it there. Yep. <laughs> um, so, well, why don't we look ahead? There's probably nothing else to talk about for this week, so why don't we look at this week that's coming up? Yep. Three games for the Flames until we talk next. As we talked about Tuesday the 19th, the Flames are here in Calgary against Columbus, 7 p.m. start time. Thursday the 21st against Ottawa, another 7 p.m. start time. And then a quick trip on Saturday up to Vancouver, an 8 p.m. start time. That's going to be a hockey night in Canada game, so that's by the 8 o'clock. So we've got two home, one quick road game. Uh, last week, I I finally won again. We've had no winner in the prediction game since December 10th when you won, and I thought we'd beat uh, New Jersey and New York and lose to Winnipeg. You thought we'd win all three. Matt, I'm, since I win, I'm going to go first this week. I'm picking all three. Yeah, uh, I'm going to... Yeah, if if Vegas wins tonight, then I think that the Flames drop the Columbus game tomorrow. And if San Jose wins, I think they win all three. So you're just conditional on, on who wins tonight? Uh, yes. Okay, so what were the conditions? If Vegas wins tonight over San Jose in regulation, then we lose tomorrow. And you think they win the other two? Yeah, and if San Jose wins, then I think we win all three. This is like some Brian Burke trade. Exactly. It's conditional. Gotta throw some, some conditional draft picks in there. It's conditional on us, you know, winning the first round and the guy taking six baths in five days. and Yeah. Um, okay. All sorts of weird stuff. That's the first so. conditional pick we've ever had. Yeah, might as well. So if Why Vegas not? wins, you think Calgary will lose to Columbus but win to Ottawa and Vancouver. If yeah. San Jose wins, then you think that they will beat all three teams. Yeah. Okay. Well, Because I think they'll be motivated because, oh, we're not in first anymore, so we got to go and beat Columbus and, you know, retake that. And the other two teams are terrible, so they should win both. So. Well, it's been... Whereas if we're already in front... You know, I think that they might not be as hungry as they need to be. It's been a fun week at the Dome. I was at both the New Jersey and New York Rangers game last week. And 
the dome is fun these days. Like there's a lot of noise. There's a lot of people having fun. If you haven't been to a game or you haven't been to a game in let's say the last month and a half, you should go because these are the times when, uh, you're getting really good energy there and it's a great time to be a flames fan at the dome. So if you haven't grab some tickets, you can get them from the flames. You can get them from seat giant. You get them from anywhere you might buy your tickets from and check out either the Columbus or Ottawa game. If I was going to one, I'd go to Ottawa. Cause I think you'll probably see a bigger slaughter in that one. Yeah. And frankly, the, the games that are always in the back half of March and April, when the flames are pushing for a playoff spot or have a playoff spot locked up, they're always a blast, and I was to, like, I've been a season ticket holder since, like, 2004, and, yeah, it's always fun down the stretch when the games matter. Yeah, no, I, I mean, I can just speak for first-hand experience, and last week, the New Jersey and New York, which you didn't expect to be, you know, fun games, the Dome, were a lot of fun to be there. I could feel the energy from the press box. Um, I, I honestly think that maybe the Jerome thing kind of reignited the Sea of Red, because that was a big night yeah. as well. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, so anyway, let's see how this week goes. Let's hope for both of us that the Flames end up with three wins, six points in the week, and they can put some distance between them and the Sharks. Go Knights, go. <laughs> there you go. You're cheering for the Flames and the Knights. Yes. At least unless the, they actually meet in the playoffs, then, you know, go away to vegas but you know when they're playing san jose go knights you can you can cheer for them up until the time that we meet them in the playoffs exactly which hopefully is the second round hopefully we got to get past the first round first which has been hard for this team in the last little bit yeah well we've done that what twice since 89 you know so yeah <laughs> well and, and usually like that's all that's why i really don't want to play vegas in the first round just because of the franchise's history of you know like we had a seven point lead at one point not that long ago so like if we fall out of first place and then face vegas i'd fully expect just due to organizational history to lose to vegas in the first round and like great that was awesome this season you know like yeah, so well, we I'm, we've had struggles in the past with uh, really our biggest struggles have been with the Ducks and they're not making anywhere close to. So I'm almost kind of thinking to myself, wow, uh, the Ducks are nowhere close to the playoffs. Maybe this is our chance. Well, I'm hoping that the Flames, if they can win the division and play one of the weaker teams, they should win that series easily. Like, regardless of which of the three likely candidates, they should win that one in five or six and not be overly burnt from that. Where, like, if Vegas is playing San Jose, like, that's going to be an all-out drag them out war between the two teams. And, you know, if the Flames can make it through round one, then they should have an easy time in that scenario with whoever they face. So... Hopefully that's the case, and, you know, it, like, honestly, I think that whoever wins our division is the representative of the Western Conference in the Stanley Cup Finals. Yeah, so, I can see that. Because you look at the Central Division, and all three of the key teams in that division, they're kind of all equivalently very good, but not elite and, like, I think that there's only two elite teams, really, in the West, and that's us and San Jose. And so, like, if we can face a weakened San Jose team in round two, if assuming that they get past Vegas in round one, if we win, then, you know, we could go all the way. And I think that if we have to fit, play Vegas and get through them, then we're going to be a little burnt and it might be a little tough to get through the Sharks, who would likely be fresh. Well, so. for, for all you guys listening, uh, let us know who you want the Flames to play and don't want the Flames to play in round one. You can let us know uh, by commenting on the show at firesidechat.ca. You can let us know on Twitter. or at Fireside Podcast or on Facebook, where we're facebook.com slash firesidechat. So let us know who you want to see the Flames against in round one and who you don't want to see the Flames against in round one. And we'll be back next week to talk more Flames hockey, Matt. You, yep. 
let's. I, I guess maybe the sign off for this week should we go Vegas go. Go Vegas and Calgary go. There you go. Got to have some a little bit of plugging for Vegas, you know, because you know, beat the Sharks. May the power of Scorch be with them. Exactly. Right, I'm gonna stop there. Fireside Chat is hosted by Dan Stevenson, co-hosted by Matt DeBorg. This episode produced and edited by Peter Marino. Fireside Chat is licensed under Creative Commons license. For full license details, visit firesidechat.ca.